Uh, next up, we've got uh, Chester Masset. So, yes. <laughs> Uh, he's the director of cyber science and tech research at the OSD the Office of Secretary of Defense Research and Engineering, and he's here to talk about personal institutes for cyber and electromagnetic spectrum research and employ vice president. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you for the introduction, um, Tomas. Uh, again, my name is C.J. Mayshack. I'm with the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, and. Um, I have with me a team also that I'd like to introduce, have to get to know them, and certainly if you have any questions at the end of this talk, I'd appreciate it if you go out right outside the door here. We have a booth set up uh, pertaining to Viceroy, but um, if you wouldn't mind just holding up your hand when I call your name. So my ROTC Outreach uh, Advisor, uh, Associate with the Program, uh, Mr. Tom Kramer. Uh, my Air Force Research Lab Program Manager, Ms. Sonia Blumich. Our uh, Griffiths Institute Program Manager, Jennifer McCullough. And our chief talent officer with the Griffiths Institute, Elise, Alyssa Pope Walter. So um, feel free to go on and talk with them after the, after the meeting. So if we could, I just click here? Uh, oh, that oh. works, or the down arrow. Okay. Let's do that. All right. Okay. So, um, so just the bottom line up front, what I hope to accomplish here is just to give you a background about the Viceroy program, what motivated us to start the program, how it's expanded over the past three years. Uh, tell you a little bit about some of our success stories, and then hopefully, if you're inspired by this, you're excited about the product that we're producing, the students that we're producing, then I'd like you to consider in being, um, you know, um, coming to talk to us about um, either being a Maven summer internship um, host site or uh, signing up to be uh, a recipient of some of the interns uh, that come out of our program or potentially hiring them when they graduate. Um, becoming a vice versa seminar series speaker. I have uh, seminar programs to help inform students about what it's like uh, to work in Department of Defense across a variety of career fields. And more insight and experience will certainly be helpful in motivating them. Finally, as an ROTC or civilian uh, advisor, uh, again, just kind of a friend who works out in the field that can help guide some of our students throughout the program and throughout the with that, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I'll try to keep it short. I'm a native of upstate New York for about 50 years before coming here to the uh, DC area four years ago. That's not my house up there. That's not even my farm. But that's kind of the give you a picture. I came from a little farm town called Waterville, New York, to South Utica. Um, I got introduced to computing fairly early in grade school. Uh, some of these computers up here, Commodore Pet Computer, Vic 20, that's what I. Uh, grew up with. You probably grew up with something similar to that. Some of you were the Trash 80. You remember that, the TRS 80, right? Yep, so we got some of you in the back row with that, right? So uh, we learned how to program in 3.5k of memory. Uh, we learned how to write social engineering programs to uh, inflame or otherwise insult fellow students and things like that. So I got a early leg up on cyber uh, back then before we even knew cyber was a thing. Uh, from there, I got a degree at Rochester Institute of Technology and Electrical Engineering, and my first project at Air Force Research Laboratory was nothing to do with electrical engineering, cybersecurity. And that's why I'm here today. It's that uh, I got involved with a number of projects either dealing with network security, um, digital uh, forensics, uh, intrusion detection, cyber offense, and so forth, which is what actually brought me down here to uh, work for the Pentagon, the Undersecretary of Defense Research and Engineering. Um, like I said, four years ago, works other things that were not traditionally considered cyber, like vehicle security, I'm trying to figure out how to secure things such as this like three or four ton vehicle, uh, fancy towing vehicle that has many of the commercial standards that we find in our automobiles today. We've been here at those vulnerabilities. How do we secure these things on the battlefield? Um, also, uh, concurrent with that time, um, I uh, served as an instructor at uh, Utica University in their uh, financial crimes program as well as in their cyber security program. So I've taught about 80 sections over, over my career concurrently with uh, the Department of Defense. Uh, when I'm not here, um, this is where I like to be, voting. That actually is out front of Fairview Beach last uh, Labor Day weekend. Um, so I have a lot of passions, uh, but this is why I have a cyber security education passion. Why does my CTO, the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, why does she have a cyber education passion as well? Well, as the CTO, she's responsible for innovating and modernizing DOD capabilities across 14 national 
defense um, strategy tech areas. But it's not just about producing technology, it's about having the right facilities to do it, as well as having the right talent pipeline. So to that end, we have a DOD STEM office that looks across all those 14 areas. Um, but one of those 14 areas is integrated sensing and cyber. And it kind of pushes the limits on what is cyber. It's not necessarily this player thing that we grew up with that the executive director talked about being on this uh, 56K modem, whatever, uh, you know, something wired like that. It's, it's, it's become wireless. It's, it's Wi-Fi, it's Bluetooth, it's 5G. Everything is wireless now, right? So spectrum ops are really important. Um, I always say the common is the road in which cyber runs up. So understanding communications theory is just foundational. And then, of course, there's all sorts of sensors that tie cyberspace to the big of the world. Understanding that whole ecosystem, how they work together, that's the focus of the office I work for, the great sensing side. So how do, we, how do we develop talent specifically for them? That is where I run three congressional interest programs, which are indicated here. First one, all the way over on the right-hand side, University Consortium for Cybersecurity, which basically serves uh, as a focal point for closer collaboration between academia and Department of Defense on cybersecurity matters. Now, there's over 400 organizations across the country um, that participate in an RFI process, which is SECDEF or Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, in collaboration with NTUCIC, uh, NSA's uh, uh, NCAC uh, PMO, and Cyber, Com Cyber Command Academic Outreach Office collaborate on prioritizing topics. We issue them out to academia. Academia responds with their solutions. We have a competitive process in which then we allow the winners to come to NPU to talk about their uh, solutions and possibly um, get a grant award to help pursue that and develop it further for Department of Defense. So if you have any interest about that after the talk, please, please come see me. Uh, another one is the P3I, Pacific Intelligence Innovation Initiative. If I can summarize and look at the bottom line, changing the paradigm of bringing talent to light instead of growing it in Hawaii, and look at the areas. IT, cybersecurity, spectrum ops, uh, intelligence, data science. Um, even they're recognizing there within that program that that ecosystem things all kind of work together and make a good cyber operator. And then, of course, there's vice right here, but that's going to be the focus of my talk here today. So, why do we need uh, cyber education? Uh, uh, why do we need programs to help develop it further? Well, there's a line of strategic guidance here coming all the way from the White House where um, it's recognized here that we need to create and prioritize new skill based pathways um, for cybersecurity jobs. Uh, we need to tap into historically untapped uh, talent pools. And it just means it's not all about academics, but it's also about certifications too, not traditional pathways. Um, the uh, Office of the National Cyber Director put out the uh, National Cybersecurity Strategy earlier this year, which said that we really need to. Uh, build a robust and diverse cyber workforce. We need to strategically coordinate research and development investments in cybersecurity with this education as well. The DOD recognizes <coughs> this is an important thing with the publishing of their DOD cyber workforce strategy and acknowledge that not having the right workforce could potentially impact operational readiness across the department and put national security at risk. They Positive that we have four pillars of things that we need to pursue. First, identify uh, the brightest uh, and best students. Two, recruit them and help them understand what a DOD is all, career is all about and benefits for doing so. Develop them, provide education and training in leadership, teamwork, DOD missions, and those operational skills. So it's not just about tech skills, it's about the whole person. And then finally, retaining them too, because obviously, uh, we want to uh, capitalize on our investment, and we want to help keep these uh, people um, uh, in our workforce happy. We want to keep them productive. We want to give them every opportunity they can to succeed. So let's talk about Viceroy then. So Viceroy was actually born out of 2019 congressional interest, even before any of the stuff came um, that we just saw in the previous chart. Um, it was actually inspired by some of the PamaCon attendees that are here. I won't name their names, but they're in other rooms right now. But they're the ones that whispered to Congress that, hey, we need to do these things uh, and build a better partnership between the academic community and the Department of Defense. So with that, you have this authorization that you see here that says, hey, um, 
we need to establish this program uh, for cyber institutes at institutions of higher learning for the purpose of accelerating and focusing the development of foundational expertise in critical cyber operational skills for future uh, military and civilian leaders. So this does seem to have quite a military and civilian leader focus. I will also tell you though that we're developing coursework under this program that um, students who are going to go work for industry are going to benefit from and as a result we're going to benefit from them when they go to work for the defense industrial base. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So this authorization launched two programs. One was the um, Senior Military Colleges Cyber Institutes program. I will not talk about that, but it, it focused in on the six senior military colleges. And then Research and Engineering, my organization, was authorized to run a separate program that covered all the rest of the schools within the United States. And we call that Viceroy. So I just talked about the mission a moment ago. The vision here is to be recognized as the leading experiential cyber spectrum and operations mission-based education and internship pipeline, producing job-ready leaders in military, civilian, and industrial-based sectors. Point of tall order, right? Um, our approach was to focus on areas that were a uh, priority to the national defense strategy, build an enhanced pipeline that both grew the size and the quality of the students coming through the program, and increase diversity in the cyber spectrum workforce. Um, so what we did is we, we formed, uh, we solicited, uh, we had three solicitations out to uh, academic organizations across the country to um, ask them to self-form regional or topical consortiums multi-institution consortiums to focus on particular technical or um, mission-based DOD problems, develop a curriculum that may be focused on research, labs, other types of things like that to support learning, and um, work with us to develop that internship pipeline to better place the students. Congress also had some other requirements too. You see them here down below. You probably already scanned them, so I'm just kind of go over them quickly. But first one is practical instruction and experience. So that's making sure that we're not just teaching theory, but we're teaching the application of those courses to military context. That's either through projects, research, or lab. Strategic foreign languages as part of a multidisciplinary program is kind of it's not just about learning the language, but how's the language employed within, say, social media, or coding, or reverse engineering of code, and things like that. Mathematical foundations for cryptography, it's kind of somewhat explanatory. Data science, AI, ML. Um, developing early cyber interest in students at the high school and within the first and second year of the program. Think about this, all of you who went to engineering school and so forth, it took those lead out courses, right? The student to the left and the student to the right. The reason the student to the left and student to the right probably didn't make it wasn't maybe that they weren't smart enough, but maybe they weren't passionate enough to understand why it was they were taking that course and how they were going to apply it to their career. Wouldn't it have been wonderful the first semester that we went to school and we entered into a, a matriculator program, we had a seminar that explained all about the potential job opportunities in the relation of the coursework. That doesn't happen. This is one of the roles we're trying to fill with the Viceroy program for cybersecurity. Finally, in order to develop that early cyber interest, interest we need to have more engagement. That usually means more cyber instructors, typically uh, at the high school level, but also during the, um, the undergrad college level, too. So let me talk a little bit about the virtual institutes then. As I said, there's, um, we have an R5 process. There's currently six institutes, 20 academic uh, organizations that comprise those institutes. These are faculty-led, multi-institution, multi-year research endeavors. The idea here is that we would have faculty that kind of straddle the line between academia and either the DOD or national security uh, environment who could understand and interpret that for the students and help bring that to the coursework of the design of it. Again, focusing not just on the word cyber, but also on that electromagnetic spectrum operations. The institutes would propose developing new programs of study or new coursework that would specifically meet these DOD needs. Take for example, instead of teaching an RF theory course, 
What if we were to teach a course in the shirt communications and a contestant, contestant low um, um, size, weight, and power environment? Well, now I'm teaching something different. I'm thinking about how to bring different types of disciplines together now to produce that capability. Uh, of course, we sponsor research projects of interest to the DOD for Viceroy students, and we hope that the, the, the desire to have those research projects by the schools drives further school engagement into DOD uh, 6162, the uh, 63 research opportunities. Uh, we ex I encourage them to hold cyber seminars, workshops, clubs, and high stakes, mission, context type competitions. Finally, we built a sense of community between the institutions through an annual, actually it's almost like semi-annual now, right? For regular engagement where they share the lessons learned about how they developed the course, how they got the thing, how they got the course, for example, certified or accredited in only a very short period of time, things like that. And this is really paying off by taking what would normally be frenemies and making friends out of them. This is a map of our current uh, set of six regional virtual institutes comprised of 22 organizations. Um, you can see here, they're, they're, they're color-coded with the dots, so some of them are somewhat geographical. Take Washington State University in the upper left-hand corner, right? So topically, it focuses on industrial control systems. SCADA has a close relationship with the Naval Undersea Warfare Center on the keyboard, PNNL, um, and so forth. So that's where they're uh, educational focus mainly is. On the other hand, University of Detroit Mercy, they are both functional and geographical, and they focus mainly on automotive and truck vehicle security, and what are the issues with CAN bus, J1939, and so forth. A uh, really, really important, interesting story with them is that by investing in them, we're investing in the local OEM ecosystem, you know, the Forge, GMs, the Tier 1 suppliers, and so forth, were the ones that are then being sourced by, say, Oshkosh and AM General and others who are building our military um, system. So if we can build the supply chain more secure, we're getting better products out the other end. Plus our regional partners, such as the Ground Vehicle Systems Center and the Army there, they're benefiting from the pipeline of students coming out here. I could go on and on, but these are kind of the examples of what, uh, how you might envision these centers are helping the DOD uh, workforce as well as the related industrial supply chain. I'm going to kind of revisit now those uh, defense cyber workforce uh, pillars, but let me focus mainly first on the educational pipeline, which is that second row arrow you see. So as our students move from high school to undergraduate and graduate education, um, have summer experiential uh, learning, internships, and then eventually end up at the other end of the pipeline, hopefully with DOD employment, there's a set of activities that Viceroy engages in at every step of the way to break down barriers for these students or to help increase the pipeline. Over here at the high school end, um, developing the early cyber interest, enhancing the pipeline and cyber spectrum, students at the secondary school level, harnessing and expanding upon the summer camps, engaging in JROTC programs, as well as using dual enrollment. So these, by the way, you see here in green are so somewhat unique, I think, to, to Viceroy. But we found out that by getting students interested early in in the junior and senior year, we tend not to lose them. And if they already have college credit with the local institutions that are part of our DIs, they tend to go to them. And so we've got to kind of lock them into the pipeline. And it's good for brand um, um, loyalty for the uh, students with the educational programs or the schools as well. So everybody's kind of a winner in that one. At the undergrad level, uh, we build an educational program with a mission focus, uh, focusing on operational experiential learning opportunities. And we uh, are trying to reduce that weed out that I talked about by helping the students understand early on through the clubs and seminar how, what their career could be like and how the coursework relates to it. The students have demonstrated and gotten feedback, real data that the students are, um, it helps improve their uh, retention program. Um, then there's their first summer. What are you going to do in the summer? Are you going to try to go work for Chick-fil-A for 18 bucks an hour, 17 bucks an hour? Where can I get a good paying job? Oh, I could get a good paying job at $22 an hour with the DOD, but it's, it's way over there. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to get there, you know, in a high uh, expense market. So we have a couple of things. First of all, we have um, some stipends and scholarships and things like that to help students overcome the financial burdens of pursuing 
the real career interest at the location they want. And second, we have this eight-week Maven uh, internship, which I'll talk a little bit more in just a moment, um, that helps um, explain to students, uh, introducing them to DOD uh, leadership, culture, teamwork, and oral communication. Notice that those are direct tie-ins from the DCWS. Um, following that first summer and that first Maven internship, they're free to pursue other internships at other DOD sites, and we help place them. We help find them. In fact, in many cases, I don't know if, how many of you have tried to hire a student or are a student or were a student and tried to find housing for just three months in a safe place, affordable place, and expensive market. You can't do that. We have a team at the Griffiths Institute that helps our students do that, even helps them provide them transportation. Some of our students never owned a car. They lived in a, in a big city someplace. How are they going to get back and forth to work? We help them solve that. We help them pursue their dreams. Finally, in the retention, once we get them to, uh, they're interested in a final place to work, um, there may be a OPM or other types of business process that slows them down, creates uncertainty as to whether they're going to hire, be hired. We, within our program, we have a bridge program that helps a, that provides a temporary hiring mechanism for these students to hold on to them while our DOT processes uh, roll forward. So we're helping out each one of these steps in the process. And now we go back to the DCWS pillars. Each one of these steps, you can see, ties into those, those goals. Looking at it a little bit differently here, um, these are some of the leverage programs. So advice for not building everything. It's for helping to align the existing scholarships and NCA programs to the maximum effect, either at the high school level, the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, so that they have the maximum impact with the students. We have uh, approximately, I want to say 498 or 500 students in the program after only about two and a half years. Uh, we can bring about 50 this year, maybe 150 next year into our Maven Summer Experiential Program. The rest of them, they go into research internships, operational internships, or other DOD internship programs. And they go into sites with the Department of the Air Force, the Department of the Army, the Department of the Navy, Cyber Command, um, or the Department of uh, Developmental Operational Tests and Evaluation uh, Organizations. And this is where they can end up. So we, with the pipeline service of DMV civilians, uh, prospective officers, or feeds them into a master's program like Palos Acquired, or into the Defense Industrial Base. One more time. We do not uh, provide all capabilities for scholarship and stipends, but we heavily leverage these other programs to the maximum effect, including things like the DCTC, which you may not be as familiar with, the Defense Civilian Civil uh, Training Board, uh, which is actually a new program that's being piloted in four organizations, uh, academic organizations across the country. Virginia Tech is one of them. He reveals in the back row there. He can tell you a little bit more about what they're doing with this. Uh, we're leveraging these variety, this variety of scholarship programs that already exist. We're working very closely with the NSA uh, Centers of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity. Let me tell you a little bit about some of our students, um, because their stories are much more interesting than mine. We have, we have a number of students who came into the program last summer who uh, really had, thought they had different interests, or that cyber just wasn't for them. They kind of had an interest in cyber, but they didn't realize I can do this. I have an interest, and I can actually mentor others. Jake is one of those students here. So he is a uh, he's in his third year, I believe, this year. Oh, actually, he's in the second year this year, right? So uh, Washington, Central Washington University. Uh, he's an Air Force ROTC. He wants to be a pilot, so he thinks, but he's in the comp sci program, and he participates in our experiential learning program called Maven last summer. And he says, you know what? I'm reconnecting with why I thought in this program to begin with. In fact, I think I want to come back next year and not participate in this program. I want to teach the program to other prospective computer science students. So this was just an amazing opportunity for him. Um, it really relit his fire and passion for cybersecurity. Um, another student, now, she came to us from a school that would, um, when she came to us, she was with a school that was participating in the program, but she's now in another, she transferred to another college or university. She came into this program as a, as a second year. She's a um, junior in computer science this year, and she wanted to be a technological entrepreneur. 
and she really wanted to work in the area of uh, uh, modeling simulation, artificial intelligence. This program really helped her understand the interesting problems in the Department of Defense. And her parting thoughts were when she left at the end of last year, she said, you know what? Um, I'm thinking that I really want to try to solve DOD problems as maybe a, a defense industrial base upstart. Um, so she found a lot of value in this. We still keep in constant communication with her. And uh, so um, she's just an amazing success story. Now she's somebody who's going to go down the industrial path, but it's probably going to do great things for us. So there's many ways to success in right here. Um, let me just kind of wrap up with talking a little bit about Maven and then uh, we'll get off the stage here. Um, so Maven, um, this, I talked a little bit about this, about the summer experiential program. It leverages 20 years of an, of an academic program to train ROTC students or educate ROTC students in cybersecurity. Uh, we're going to have 50 students in this eight-week program in Rome uh, starting in June and ending in August. Notice we focus on leadership, community service, writing, public speaking, research, career day, cap, there's a capstone, there's building trips, uh, lots of things to introduce you to DOD culture. Focusing on mission systems, actually let me tell you a little bit about the eight-week curriculum, uh, the elements of the eight-week eight, eight curriculum, introducing them first to DOD careers, problem sets, the missions, the systems that support those problem sets, and then now we're going to go over and talk about the core cyber and electromagnetic concerns and principles with them now that we kind of understand or excited about this. And then of course teaches te teamwork, leadership, feedback, and assessment. It culminates in something called the Maven Internship Capstone. So this is a high stakes mission oriented challenge in which the problems are so large a team has to work together to win. You can't have just one hot shot that knows it all. You have to have students that want to learn it all and work together and exercise good teamwork. And that's and it's based on it's it's a, it's a complicated vignette. It's probably or a complicated scenario has about ten different vignettes. We pick specific vignettes that we use to uh, 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 challenge the students. Uh, one of these is called Concord Dawn, and uh, this is the actual scenario that's used for the Air Force and Space Force for training their first year officers. So when they come in, to, when they leave our program, they can actually be leaders in the program as first-year officer, uh, helping to mentor the students that are participating in it. One thing I will say about the Maven internship program is that students who came out of it said, I finally understand how to learn. I understand why I'm taking this coursework. I know how to apply it. I'm actually very, very excited now about the course I selected. We're currently conducting MAVEN only at the Air Force Research Laboratory, um, but we're expanding it to the Army and Navy for next year. We're looking for organizations to shadow us this year to learn how to conduct the program. Uh, we do have some interest in the Navy. We have not we have yet to hear from the Army. If anyone knows who I can contact in the Army who would be interested in conducting this eight-week course, week course in summer 2024, please let me know. And there are resources available to do this, so we're not just asking you to do it out of your own pocket. We also have internship shop sites across the country, in which we've established places for uh, students to live, transportation, and so forth. Uh, we have four major sites, but we have 34 um, DOD internships uh, that we're conducting uh, this summer with our interns. Uh, we have accomplishments too. I think in the interest, I think I just of time, I just need to get to the end here and just want to let you know that how can you get involved? If you'd like to be a summer 2024 Maven uh, internship post site, you don't have to be a research organization. You can be a test and evaluation. You can be all sorts of different types of organizations that host this. Please let us know. If you'd like to receive our interns or receive our students when they're ready for employment, please let us know. We'll get you into the pipeline. If you want to inspire students by being a speaker, please see us. We'd love to hear about your experience, experiences. And then finally, if you'd like to be an advisor to our cadets or civilians, uh, we'd love to have you on board. With that, I just want to say thank you for your time. I am out of time, unfortunately, so it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to take any questions. But uh, again, please see us outside at the booth after uh, this session is over. Thank you very much.